Hey guys, what's up? So today I want to talk about growth hormone as it pertains to physique enhancement. And um, this is a very interesting compound that has significant potential for both hypertrophy and fat loss if used correctly. And I think delving into and, and understanding the mechanism of action of how this compound can work will help guide us in terms of appropriately um, strategizing a dosing protocol. Um, from a timing standpoint and interaction with other hormones um, as I said to kind of like optimize the, the net outcome that we can actually achieve from this compound um, so yeah let's get into it a little bit of a background so growth hormone is produced endogenously via the pituitary gland um, which sits just below the hypothalamus and plays a key role in regulating body composition metabolism and repair um, you'll also hear anecdotal use to with regards to rejuvenative or skin health properties the the benefit of which can actually be disputed and um, obviously it's not something we're going to get into today but its clinical application is for stuff like skeletal and gastrointestinal development or muscle wasting diseases and development of sexual tissue so it will help attenuate muscle wastage um, and also repair both skeletal tissue from a muscular and bone health or osteoblast um, standpoint as well as gastrointestinal um, development as well and um, so actually just the the development of the tissues in around the stomach um, if they were to be impaired. Uh, so that's done typically through IGF-1 expression and it's also a very potent agent in terms of mobilizing fat and increasing for fuel oxidation. Um, so we can see how this can be a very, very interesting compound within our cohort of, again, physique enhancement and body composition optimization. Um, so let's get into the mechanism of action behind which. Um, shortly after we'll just explain the growth hormone deficiency can arise from a malformation of the hypothalamus or pituitary gland so as i said the gland that actually secretes this if there is if it's not formed properly obviously we won't get this um production also this can be impaired by an inflammation or tumors around these um glands or tissues as well as psychosocial disorders and that's something um robert sapolsky goes into a little bit more detail on and um, within his book why zebras don't get ulcers resistance can also occur from growth hormone mutation growth hormone receptor mutations where the, the hormone is present it's being circulated but it's not the receptor it has a mutation and isn't actually recognizing this so we'll see this synthetic formulation of recombinant human growth hormone, so or HGH, um, which is administered um, via injection either subcutaneously, but we'll actually come back to this. Um, you'll see studies done on continuous or um, pulsatile dosing. Um, and then we can also see how potentially we could get some benefit from some intramuscular dosages here. Um, but again, we'll go through this later on. So d delving into its efficacy with regards to lipolysis and hypertrophy uh, fat loss makes sense to go through first because it is much simpler um, so first of all we need to distinguish between the mobilization and, oxida and oxidation within fat loss so these are two separate entities to an extent and um, we just need to have to have a clear distinguish and um, distinguish between them so we'll see here from this graph this diagram on the left hand side and the mobilization of triacylglycerols or triglycerides within adipose tissue. So fats are stored as triglycerides within a fat cell. We have this um, we have this here noted by glucagon, but again it's gonna have the same oops. Um, yeah, glucagon, but we also have the same effect from growth hormone, epinephrine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, whatever you want to call it. Um, basically, this catecholamine secretion will give the same response, where we have an increase in cyclic AMP, which again will increase uh, protein kinase A, which allows us to phosphorylate hormone sensitive lipase. The function, sorry, the function of hormone sensitive lipase will be to mobilize that triacylglycerol or triglyceride from the fat cells. So when we have this increase in HSL, the triglyceride is taken out of the fat cell. And that's what we want if we're trying to lose body fat. That fatty acid, um, or the, the three fatty acids, are then in the bloodstream where they can then be go undergo beta oxidation and be used within a fuel oxidation or a fat burning standpoint. So we have to be in a state to mobilize this fat to use it as fuel um, 
so yeah that's all mentioned there um so we have as i said we can see how this secretion of growth hormone or any catecholamine will have this effect to allow increased mobilization but also the mechanism of, mechanism of action is associated with increased beta adrenergic uh, increased expression of beta adrenergic receptors or density of which so we have this increase in mobilization but we also have a potential increase for the actual oxidization or burning of fat cells so on the other side of this lipolytic axis is the way i like to coin it um we have like insulin ketones and amino acids which have the opposite effect you know what i mean so we have high catecholamines will increase cyclic amp and um, any of these other free circulating bodies will actually decrease that um, and then they have that kind of direct effect towards HSL and lipolysis. So basically, if we have insulin, ketones, or amino acids, we're going to burn less fat. Um, so yeah, we want to keep these low, so it makes sense to deploy this in a fasted state. We see peak growth hormone serum levels typically two and a half hours post subcutaneous administration. So if we couple this with like let's say a three hour fasting window, um, to get kind of like peak dosage and allow it to tail off. If we couple that with some non-glucose intensive cardiovascular work, like basically just some low intensity steady state cardio, that's how we can optimize the uh, the efficacy and um, to actually increase the fat burning effect of net oxidation of fat cells. So growth hormone will also modulate or attenuate amino acid oxidase, oxidation to exert an anti-catabolic effect so by that what i mean is we're going to have a decreased oxidation of amino acids which means we're not going to be in a catabolic state and those circulating amino acids aren't going to have a decrease in this kind of lipolytic um, response so as i said even amino acids will attenuate or slow down this fat burning process so if you're doing fasted cardio and you're sipping BCAAs or EAAs, you're not doing fasted cardio. You know what I mean? We still want to keep those amino acids low. Um, so yeah, during this time, we're also in a transient state of insulin resistance via downregulation of GLUT1 expression. Um, and glucose is released hepatically, i.e. from the liver and from the muscle, which, again, that circulating blood glucose will raise your, your FBG, your fasting blood glucose levels. Um, so... Yeah, this is where people may get this interpretation of growth hormone causing insulin resistance. It's in a transient state, not going to be systemic or, or chronic. Then, again, this is also going to match your circadian rhythm. So during the night where you actually secrete the most amount of growth hormone endogenously, we're going to be in a state of insulin resistance. And again, this is going to allow for increased HSL expression. Well, it's going to have a decrease in lipoprotein lipase activity, which again is the storage hormone, allows us to, to move fat cells into the adipocytes. So if we decrease the activity of that um, enzyme um, or that lipoprotein, then we're going to have net less storage effect of these circulating fatty acids. So more fatty acids circulating, more being mobilized. If we do not oxidize these, we have this negative effect we don't want all these fatty acids in the bloodstream continuously this can result in dyslipidemia which is an, et is an etiological factor or is potentially con um, can result in the onset of diabetes also associated with other kind of um, chronic heart and, and blood lipid um, outcomes that we obviously want to avoid so growth hormone can assist the hypertrophic response um, via IGF. So again, this is going into hypertrophy now. Um, but this growth hormone alone will not add any new muscle tissue. You may see this being misrepresented in the studies when they say growth hormone is increased lean body mass. That is typically done via its water retentive properties via decreased excretion of sodium and potassium um, as well as aldosterone and um, angiotensin so that can obviously skew the data now when we're looking at IGF-1 we have to distinguish between endocrine and autocrine so endocrine is your systemic IGF uh, which is secreted from the liver and this is have this has zero association with net hypertrophic responses in this is not associated with putting on any muscle tissue if anything, it, it appears to have a negative feedback mechanism for regulating autocrine levels. So autocrine or localized within the muscle is going to be associated with our hypertrophy or anabolic response. 
when you use large bolus dosing, let's say daily or every second day of considerable amounts, we get this spike in endocrine levels, which isn't that isn't going to be isn't going to contribute to hypertrophy from the literature anyway. So when we look at endocrine levels, as I said, more kind of pulse soil dosing, let's say twice daily, and um, we'll see these localized levels remain elevated for days. And there is an anecdotal site enhancement property with this, whereas if you inject this into a particular body part, you will have more localized expression and you'll have potentially more hypertrophy within that muscle tissue. There is a desensitization with regards to growth hormone between doses of like over 90%, even like five hours apart. So after a single dose, your body isn't that responsive, but this is attenuated via insulin. And this can be endogenous. So either have a carb rich meal between dosing or use an exogenous insulin. Um, note as well that Lantus has the greatest binding affinity to growth hormone. So it's gonna be very, very effective to couple with um, growth hormone. So, Anabolic androgenic steroids um, have been shown to elevate growth hormone and IGF levels, but anabolism is also seen in growth hormone deficient individuals. So from what this from this we can extrapolate that we, we know that anabolic steroids will increase muscle tissue, but it's also done without IGF expression. So it can function independently of this. However, when we couple these, i.e. anabolic steroids looking at, at the net muscle mass accretion uh, growth hormone we know does not accrete any new protein if we couple these together we have a greater synergistic effect and that is seen consistently within the literature so again we know that steroids can add tissue independent of igf1 if we couple this with increased igf1 we get a greater outcome so growth hormone increases androgen receptor density while testosterone increases total growth hormone receptors and decreases IGF binding protein. So again, when we understand the function of a binding protein, it typically inactivates a particular molecule. If we can decrease those binding proteins, we have more free circulating IGF expression. So mRNA expression via IGF-1 is elevated in males with an estrogenic component. So it makes sense that when you use like this is shown within the literature as well. When we use aromatizing steroids, i.e. testosterone, um, that do convert to estrogen, we see a greater expression of IGF-1 and greater increases. Um, again, the synergistic component between growth hormone and testosterone is more than, let's say, if we were to use something like nandrolone, which does not aromatize and does not increase our, our estrogen. Um, again, another thing to note as well is that if we are using super physiological levels of testosterone, we want super physiological levels of estrogen. They work in synergy. It's going to be a ratio between the two. It doesn't make sense to spike one and keep the other within range. However, growth hormone is sexually dimorphic, i.e. the response within IGF levels in females is piss poor. You are not going to see any real hypertrophic outcome in females using growth hormone. However, the mechanism of action and the efficacy from a lipolytic standpoint is the exact same. So you, it is still very, very effective for fat loss in females, even at a single unit per day. However, when you're looking at um, IGF expression, i.e. through hypertrophy, to match IGF levels, you're gonna need more than three times the level of growth hormone. So again, the dose response relationship just doesn't really support a decision to utilize this uh, within females. So the jack staff pathway has also a, a direct role in regulation of IGF. Preventing desensitization of this pathway should be a priority. So we see jack stat pathway is basically kind of like a balance between your growth hormone and insulin. Um, whereas we do not want to just completely hammer one end of, of the nail here. We want to keep, the, keep this in balance and keep the synergistic effect. Um, so exogenous thyroid, uh, typically recommended to balance out the deiodination of T4 to T3. However, this balances out over time, so there's not much um, efficacy or use for actually supplementing with exogenous thyroid above replacement doses. And that actually shows you have a negative outcome when we're looking at serum IGF expression, increased muscle protein breakdown, because again, any lipolytics are going to be catabolic by nature. So if we're increasing our muscle protein breakdown, we are reducing our IGF expression and we're increasing the secretion rate of growth hormone. 
these are going to be negative towards total hypertrophic outcome. So again, just keep this if you need to use exogenous thyroid within replacement doses based off current and previous blood work, then yes, you don't have a negative outcome. But if we're going to go elevated levels, this may be negative towards our hypertrophic um, requirements or our goals within that current phase. So hopefully that covers um, growth hormone. There are some references. So again, just a brief recap, three hour fasted window with growth hormone for lipolysis, avoiding amino acids within this time frame. Um, potentially one thing as well that I forgot to mention was the increased beta adrenergic receptor expression, potentially coupling this with another compound such as clenbuterol can be very, very therapeutic. Um, from a hypertrophic standpoint, we simply want to look at increasing autocrine levels um, via pulsatile dosing um, and then potentially even looking at intramuscular to increase localized expression within let's say non-responsive or lagging body parts so hopefully that makes sense any questions shoot me a message peace out have a good one